Hey, 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 welcome once again to Word Addiction. I hope that you're well and you've been kept well in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, today, by God's grace, we're going to read through the book of Isaiah, chapter number 17, all through to chapters number 21. And I believe that as we read the scriptures, that your heart will be, you know, expectant and ready for the Lord to deposit in your spirit a word that shall bring transformation into your life in the name of our Jesus Christ. So why don't you pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you, we thank you. We say the King of glory, all honor, all praise, and all power belongs to you. What a wonderful moment this is that you've granted us just to be in, uh, in, in, in this place, just to study and to read through your word, King of glory, in its simplest form, O oh God. Let your word come forth with revelation. Let your word come forth with insight. Let each and every one of us receive an instruction, an impartation, a word that shall change, King of glory, uh, you know, their lives for the glory and the honor of your holy name. We bless your holy name, Jesus Christ, that we pray and trust in and believe in it. Amen. Isaiah chapter number 17, verses 1, the Bible says, The burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease. From being a city, and it will be Runia's, Arunia's heap. The cities of Aror are forsaken. They will be for flocks which lie down, and no one will make them afraid. The fortress also will cease from Ephraim, the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. There will be as the glory of the children of Israel, says the Lord of hosts. In that day, it will come to pass that the glory of Jacob will win and the, fat, and the fatness of his flesh grow lean. It shall be as when the harvester gathers the grain and reaps the heads with his ham. It shall be as he who gathers heads of grain in the valley of Raphim. Yet gleaning grapes will be left in, uh, in it like the shaking of an olive tree. Two or three olives at the top of, of the uttermost bough. Four or five in its most fruitful branches, says the Lord God of Israel. In that day, a man will look at his maker and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altars, the work of his hands. He will not respect what his fingers have made, nor the wooden images, nor the incense altars. He says, this is a judgment that will come upon Ephraim. This is a judgment that will come upon Damascus. And he says, they shall be such a ravish. Of course, he will leave some remnant. That's why he talks about um, Yet gleaning grapes will be left in it like the shaking of an olive tree. Two or three olives at the top of the uttermost bough. Four or five in its most fruitful branches, says the Lord God of Israel. He says there shall be a remnant. Yes, there shall be destruction, but there shall be some remnant there. And he says, and the people of forsaken their God, their maker, shall look at him. And what will happen? And their eyes or his eyes will have respect. For the Holy One of Israel. You know, he says this shakeup is coming. This um, judgment is coming. Of course, he will not wipe everyone because he shall have, you know, they shall be a remnant. And the remnant are the people who will still be walking in righteousness and, you know, loving the Lord and following his law. And that's why he said, you know, you cannot escape. You cannot stop a prophecy from being fulfilled. You can only seek for you know uh what, what 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 do we say you can only seek for preservation that it may not fall upon you you know so the remnants will be there but they shall look at the god of israel their eyes their eyes or his eyes shall look at the god is maker the only one of israel and what they will have a respect for him you know, there are things that, um, unless they happen in your life, when you've gone astray, you'll always think that you're right. And, you know, there's things that happen that sober you up. There are things that you'll not wish 
to happen but they happen you know perhaps it could be a dead uh, the death of a loved one you know and god just uses that situation to bring a certain understanding or a certain perception in your life so god says this judgment that i'm bringing it will bring a certain perception to the people who will remain as remnants in these places and they shall look at their god and they will respect him remember they are in such a situation because the people the land the authorities the residents they never had a reverence for god they never respected him everyone went astray and everyone started building most of the people started building their own altars and worshiping the idols that they had made with their own hands but this time they will look upon their maker and they will have honor and respect for him in that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow and an up, up, uppermost branch which they left because of the children of israel there will be desolation because you have forgotten the god of your salvation and have not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold therefore you will plant pleasant plants and set out foreign seedlings in that in the day you will make your plant to grow and in the morning you will make your seeds to flourish but the harvest will be a heap of ruins in the day of grief and desperate sorrow he says do you know what you will labor without harvest you will labor without result for a believer who forsakes their god in the pursuit of other gods they labor without seeing what they are laboring for and it is a curse actually you know there are people who go and say do you know because money can become a god actually the i say this that the thing that fights for the place of god in your life is not even the devil it is money that's what christ says you cannot serve god both god and mammon mammon is the spirit of money so you cannot serve both god and mammon because it does not say you cannot serve both god and the, the devil a lot of people that are wise enough not to worship the devil but the but the thing difference that lies with money is this when you are looking at it when you're reading the book of ecclesiastes the preacher writes and he says money answereth all things there are things when you have money you will cease to seek god if your heart is not right and that's why we said in our church this year that our theme scripture is to get back to the remembrance that do you know what we are people who are given to pursue the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you we are given to pursue after god we are given to pursue after the kingdom of god and his righteousness and then all the other things uh, shall indeed follow us in the name of our jesus christ so he says do you know what you will go and try to figure out for yourselves you'll try to go and plant you'll try to go and bring exotic you know why, why will they do that because most of the times when you're when you're planting you'll feel because i'm not having a good harvest because perhaps the seeds that i'm using and it's part of agriculture the 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 soil i mean the, the soil does not uh, does not respond well in terms of producing a good harvest for that seed that's why that when you're doing uh, agriculture they'll advise you if you've planted maize for some time in a in a certain season don't don't plant again maize do some leguminous plants there do some potatoes there why so that the you know the the i don't know how they call it in agriculture but I remember reading it so that the soil, you know, when you come back again to, to, to plant the corn or the maize, you will have a better yield than you had. So when you start seeing the yield going down, you are told, you know what, change the seeds, change what you're planting so that the soil can have rest from the, from the you know, because if, if, if it is the maize that you're, you, that, that you're planting, the maize constantly requires a certain... Um, what do we call them ingredients uh, uh or, or rather 
how do we call them? <laughs> um, new trends. Yeah, you, you, they need these new trends. So you, you, you will have to say that I'm stopping the plantation of maize and I will introduce in the leguminous plants or potatoes or, uh, you know, or um, other forms of vegetables so that the land can rest. And when you come back to plant the maize, it will give you a better yield. So these people, because of the cast that God has brought to the land, they will think, do you know what? Let us go and take foreign seeds. Bring them here that they may produce for us a harvest. But God tells, listen, even that in your labor, it shall be all for nothing. What to the multitudes of my people, wall, who make noise like the roar of seas, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them, and they will flee far away. And be just like the chaff of the mountain before the wind, like a rolling a thing before the wild wind. Then behold, at even tide, trouble, and before the morning it is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Meaning, do you know what? The nation will rise. It will be so powerful. You know, these are Syrians. They will rise. They will be so powerful. But guess what? The tables will turn. The tides will turn. That's what God, that's actually the term that, that the scripture uses. The tides will turn. And what was once a strong nation will cease. What was once a strong tide will cease. What to the land shadowed with buzzing wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which sends ambassadors by sea, even in vessels of reed on waters, saying, Go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth of skin to a people terrible from their beginning onward a nation powerful and treading down whose land the rivers divide holy inhabitants of the world and the dwellers on the earth when he lifts up a banner on the mountains you will see it and when he blows a trumpet you hear it for so the Lord said to me, I will take my rest, and I will look from my dwelling place. Like clear heat in sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heart of harvest. For before the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, it will both cut off the springs with pruning hooks, and take away and cut down the, the branches. They will be left together for the mountain birds of prey and for the beasts of the earth. The birds of prey will summer on them and all the beasts of the earth will winter on them. In that time, a present will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall, smooth of a skin and from, the, from a people terrible from the beginning onward, a nation powerful and treading down whose land the rivers divide to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, of hosts to Mount Zion. This is God speaking and he says, um, you know, let the messengers come from Ethiopia to the land that is divided by the rivers. It's probably the, uh, the land of Israel, uh, you know, the land that is divided by the rivers. And let them bring this message. And as they bring this message, God says things will turn around and guess what? And people will start bringing a gift or gifts to the house of the Lord. When we go and uh, when we go back to the book of um, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter number 32. Yeah, after the defeat of uh, Sennacherib, well, after the defeat of Sennacherib, you know, who was um, the king of Assyria, in verses 27, the Bible says, Ezekiah had very great riches, 
and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items, storehouses for the harvest of grain, wine, and oil, and stalls for all kings of livestock and folds of flocks. Moreover, he provided city for himself and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much property. This same Ezekiah also stopped the water outlet of Upper Gihon and brought the waters by the tunnel of the side of the city of David. Ezekiah prospered in all his works. However, regarding the ambassadors, uh, regarding the ambassadors, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him that he may know all that was in his heart. We see that Ezekiah became so prosperous after the defeat of, Sanhem, um, of uh, uh, Sennacherib, you know, uh, in, in the land of Israel. We read this when uh, uh, the king of Syria, you know, he came and he brought threats to Israel. And he told Ezekiah, the people, why is Ezekiah lying to you that you're going to be protected? For what I did to other nations that are even stronger than Israel, I shall do to you. And so Ezekiah takes that letter, presents it before the presence of God. And as they pray, as he prays, because Isaiah was there, as he prays before the living God, the word of the Lord reaches them. And so when we come to verses number uh, uh, 20, it says the Second Chronicles 32, 20 says, Now because of the king Ezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried out to heaven, then the Lord sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor, leader and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. And when he was defeated, he went to his own temple uh, where his gods are, and his sons you know, killed him. And then in verses 23, the Bible says, And many brought gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem and presents to Ezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations thereafter. So the world, the wealth, the pomp that Ezekiah had was a result of him putting his trust in the living God. Even when the king of Syria threatened him, but as a king, he said, you know what? My trust is in the living God. And God gave him victory over this man. And so the nations of the earth, remember, this is what happens. Sennacherib has defeated a couple of nations. Is feared all around. So he comes to Israel, a nation that looks, you know, not as strong as the others that he has defeated. And so to his surprise, the God of Israel arises and protects Israel. So he comes down. Everybody knows because he's a bragging king. Everybody knows that Israel is going to be fought. Ezekiel is not going to come out of this. But miraculously, because of putting his trust in God, and remember this Romans 10, 11, those that put their trust in God will never be put to shame. So Ezekiah puts his trust in God. God fights for him. This king is wiped out. Now the nations of the world feel this, that it is Ezekiah, it is Ezekiah who has come with the knowledge or the breakthrough that they needed to get off the yoke of the Syrians from their neck. So what do they do? They come with gifts of appreciation to Jerusalem, not only to bring to Ezekiah, but also to the God of Ezekiah. And so this is what the Bible says now when we come to read chapter number 18. There are powerful nations treading down whose land the rivers divide. Uh, uh, sorry. In that time, a present will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth of skin. When you stand strong for the living God, God shows up for you. You will be honored for your faith. You are not stupid to put your trust and hope in the Lord. There is honor that comes with it. Don't throw away your faith. 
for it has got great recompense. Isn't that what the book of Hebrews teaches us? Don't throw out your faith, for it has got great recompense. Hold on to your faith, it has a reward. The burden against Egypt, he says, Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. The idol of Egypt will totter at his presence, and the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. I will set Egyptians against Egyptians. Whoever will fight against, everyone will fight against his brother, and everyone against his neighbor. City against a city. Kingdom against kingdom. The spirit of Egypt will fail in its midst. I will destroy their council and they will consult the idols and the charmers, the medians, the mediums and the sorcerers. And the Egyptians I will give into the hand of a cruel master and a fierce king will rule over them, says the Lord, the Lord of hosts. It says the spirit of Egypt shall be broken. What was the spirit of Egypt? The unity that they had, the oneness that they had. You know, that's why they were able to build, you know, a, a, a such a magnificent and strong economy because they were one. They were one people. So he says, do you know what? I will break that spirit, but do you know what? Turning a brother against a brother, Egyptian against Egyptian, a man against his neighbor, and the spirit of unity shall be destroyed. What makes Egypt, Egypt shall be destroyed. The waters, the waters will fail from the sea and the river will be washed and dried up. The rivers will turn foul. The brooks of defense will be emptied and dried up. The reeds and rushes will wither. The papyrus reeds by the river, by the mouth of the river and everything sworn by the river will wither be driven away and be no more. The fishermen also will mourn, and those, all those will lament who cast hooks into the river, and they will languish who spread nets on the waters. Moreover, those who work in the fine, those who work in fine flax, and those who weave fine fabric will be ashamed, and its foundations will be broken. All who make wages will be troubled of soil. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. Pharaoh's wise counselors give foolish counsel. How do you say to Pharaoh, I am the son? I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings. Where are they? Where are your wise men? He says, let them tell you now and let them know what the Lord of hosts has purposed against Egypt. The princes of Zoan have become fools. The princes of North are deceived. They have also deluded Egypt, those who are the, main, the, the mainstay of its tribes. The Lord has mingled a perverse spirit in her midst, and they have caused, it, and they have caused Egypt to error in all their work. Why has God done this? To bring confusion to the nation of Israel, that even their mediums, their sorcerers, the princes, the people who are wise will not have an understanding of what the Lord is doing. And when the Lord confuses them, these people who are wise shall bring a, an error or leading or information that will mislead Egypt as a drunken man staggers in his vomit. Neither will there be any work for Egypt which the head, uh, which the head or toil, palm branch or bulrush may do. In that day, Egypt will be like women and will be afraid and fear because of waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he waves over it. And the land of Judah will be a terror to Egypt. Everyone who makes mention of it will be afraid in himself. Because the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he has determined against it. The people will look at Egypt and they'll be astonished because of the counsel of God against it. When God has declared a judgment, I've said you can only, you know, seek an exemption. You can only seek an exemption. 
You can't stop the prophecy from being fulfilled, but you can seek an exemption for it. And so it says the people who will stand there and look at what is happening to Egypt, they'll be astonished. They'll just be astonished because of what God has done. In the day five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear by the Lord of hosts. One will be called the city of destruction. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. Why? For they will cry to the Lord because of the oppression, because of their oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a mighty one. The capital O. And he will deliver them. Then the Lord will be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. And will make sacrifice and offerings. Yes, they will make a vow to the Lord and they will perform it. They will honor it. They will fulfill it. And the Lord will strike Egypt. He will strike and heal it. They will return to the Lord and he will be entreated by them. And he shall heal them. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrian will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria. And the Egyptians will serve the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be one of, uh, will be one of uh, three with Egypt and Assyria. A blessing in the midst of the land. Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hand, and Israel, my inheritance. In the first year that Tatan came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and took it. At the same time, the Lord spoke by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and remove the sackcloth from your body and take your sandals of your feet, off your feet. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. Imagine. God commands you, do you know what? I want you to take this assignment. This is my word. Go. For how many years? For three. Walking naked and barefoot. What as an assignment? Then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot, three years. For a sign and a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia. So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians as prisoners and Ethiopians as captives. Young and old, naked and barefoot, with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. They shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation and Egypt their glory. And inhabitants of this territory will say in that day, Surely such is our expectation. Wherever we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? You know, two things come up here. Number one, if you're serving God, be ready for him leading you <laughs> into strange things. He may not tell you to walk naked as Isaiah, but one of the things that stops a lot of people from serving God is shame. A lot of believers, you know, they are afraid of serving God because maybe it will bring shame to them. You know, they'll be labeled, you know, Jesus freak or something like that. And, uh, you know, serving God means totally forsaking yourself, abandoning yourself. Whatever you have considered as worthwhile for you, like the Apostle Paul says, whatever I have gained, I consider it to be done. In other words, get, be ready to walk in shame for Christ, to be persecuted for him. When God commands you to do something that it seems, you know, it is below your rank, you must be ready to do it when you're serving God. If you really want to serve God to the end, you must really put your life and say, do you know what? My life does not count before the living God. 
So Isaiah walks naked for three years, naked and barefoot. The people look at his nakedness, and then he says, for three years, imagine for three years, just walking naked, and God is not bringing a word. And then finally he says, as Isaiah has walked before you naked for three years, this shall be the judgment amongst these people. When you forsake God, you will be ashamed. If you fail to put your trust in him, remember that scripture that we've said, Romans 10, 11, those that put their trust in God shall never be put to shame. So it means if you fail to put your trust and your faith in God, you will be ashamed. You will be naked. You will have no protection. You will have no cover. Your things will not, be, uh, will not be working. You will start because you think you have money, but your money will reach somewhere and it will stop. And people will say, look at that project so-and-so started. He started with pomp. He started with what, with what he thought, but now the project is stalled. But if you put your trust in God, he'll supply the resources to complete the project that you've started for the honor and the glory of his holy name. So these people shall be ashamed because they have chosen not to put their trust in the living God. The burden against the wilderness of the sea, he says, as whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it comes from the desert from a terrible land. A distressing vision is, de is declared to me. The treacherous dealers deals treacherously, and the plunder plunders. Go up, O Elam. Besiege, O media, all its, sign, all its uh, signing I have made to cease. Therefore, my loins are filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold of me like the pangs of a woman in labor. I was distressed when I heard it. I was dismayed when I saw it. My heart, wave, uh, my work, my heart wavered. Fearful, uh, fearfulness frightened me. The night for which I longed, it turned into fear for me. Prepare the table, set a watchman in the tower. Eat and drink. Arise, you princes, anoint your shield. For thus has the Lord said to me, Go, set a watchman. Set a watchman. Let him declare what he sees. And he saw a chariot with a pair of horsemen, a chariot of donkeys and a chariot of camels. And he listened earnestly with great care, and he cried, A lion. May lo uh, my Lord, I stand con co uh, continually on the watch on the watchtower in the daytime. I have sat at my post every night, and look, here comes a chariot of men with a pair of horsemen. Then he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the carved images of our gods, he has broken, he has broken to the ground. So 21 just simply talks about the destruction of Babylon. You know, as people await for their salvation, he says, as a watchman, go and stand on, the, on your watch and see, what do you see? He says, these are the things that I see. I said, the interpretation is simple. Babylon has fallen. It has fallen. There is no oppression that does not have an end. For a person who discovered I have erred, and this is the calamity has befallen me. You know, he says, once these people have returned to him, he has assured that the person who has oppressed you, the nation that has oppressed you, it will come to an end. When the enemy comes in to steal, to kill, and to destroy, he has a known end. When we come to read the book of um, Revelation, you will see that even the devil will have an end. He knows about his future. Whenever he oppresses your life, whenever he wants to infringe your rights as a child of the covenant, remind the devil that he has an end. He knows about it. Know your rights. And know this, that there is no situation that does not have an end. There is no affliction that God cannot deliver you from. Look unto him. Call unto him. Be like a watchman. 
Look unto the Lord. He is the source of your help. He is the source of your salvation. When you put your trust in him, God will show up and your oppressor will have the tables turned against him. As Babylon fell, so will your oppressors fall in the name of our Jesus Christ. Oh, my threshing and the grain of my flow, that which I have heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have declared it to you. The barren against Duma, he calls to me out of a seer, watchman of the night, watchman, watchman, what of the night, watchman, what of the night. The watchman said, the morning comes and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire, return, come back. The barren against Arabia, in the forest of Arabia you will lodge, or you traveling companies of Dentonites, O inhabitants of the land of Atema, bring water to him who is thirsty. With their bread they, they met him who fled, for they fled from the sword, from the drawn sword, uh, from the bent bow, and from the distress of war. For thus the Lord has said to me, Within a year, according to the year of a hired man, all the glory of, Ked of Kedar will fall, and the remainder of the number of Hers, the mighty men of the people of Kedar, will diminish. For the Lord God of Israel has spoken it, and he has spoken it, and it will surely come to pass. When God sets his eyes to do something, when God speaks forth his word to do something, listen, his word will not return to him void, but it must accomplish what he sent it to accomplish. When God speaks something in your life, whether it is a promotion or a distraction, listen to it. Go before the Lord. If you want to stop what God has said he's going to do, he has given you in his word. He says, repent. Turn away from your wickedness. I will heal your land. I will forgive your sins. I will heal your land. Repentance opens the doors of mercies into your life. But an arrogant spirit, a haughty spirit that says, I don't need God. Let him do what he thinks he can do. Oh my God, great will be your fall. Pride will come before a mighty fall. But a person who humbles himself before the presence of God, with all humility and repentance of heart, the Lord shows himself faithful. The Lord fights their battle. Put your trust in him. Put your faith in him. Where you have erred, repent and come back into a loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will see the wonders that the grace and the mercies of God can establish in your life. In Jesus' name. We've come to the end of our reading today. And I want to believe it has been a blessing to you. See you tomorrow, same time, same place. Shalom.